Thanks very much. So my name is Steve, I'm from the University of Queensland. I'm heading over to CSIRO to be doing hopefully more of the same thing because it's really fun. Um, I'm talking about exactly the same types of methods that Chelsea and Kate are talking about. And I think getting the definitions right to begin with is really important here as well because Chelsea's talking about Wizard of Oz. I'm talking about speculative design and design fiction. And I think Kate's talking about something very similar, but with different definitions. And it's worth, it's worth bearing in mind these definitions because there's a rich body of research on each of these things, even though they share a lot of similarities, which is the purpose of the workshop, which is understanding people's opinions on things that don't exist yet. It's one of the most important things you can do in research, in customer research, and lots of different fields do it. Behavioural economists do it, interaction designers do it, marketers do it. And it's, um, and it's just worth um, noting down these terms because there's so much cool research, like there's lots of cool literature on each of them. So I'm calling it design fiction and I'm calling it speculative design. And I'm talking about a app that I made called Neighbourhood Watch about using speculative design to explore household values around curtailment and consent in household energy interactions, where curtailment is basically switching things off. The network wants us to use less power at about five to seven o'clock at night when everyone's using all the power and the sun's gone down, so there's no solar. The network would love everyone to use less, so there's a lot of behavioural nudges to try and get us to use less. Us as consumers, like, hang on, I'm cooking dinner, I'm not turning off the stove. <laughs> So, speculative design is looking at what's possible, plausible, probable, or preferable. It's all about future looking. That by speculating more at all levels of society and exploring alternative scenarios, reality is going to become more malleable because people can't easily interact with what they don't know. And speculative design is, is a really useful way of doing it. A reason why speculative design is so important is because we have trouble anticipating the future. Things like willingness to pay surveys, for instance, yes, they're a good instrument, but one of their weaknesses is the fact that it's like, in the future, if you own a battery, like a household battery, what's your willingness to pay for, um, say, a particular service? And that's a bit hard because I don't own a battery yet. And the service that you're talking about, well, in, in, in two years' time when I've got a battery, the kids are going to be a bit old, look, it's hard to tell. So I give a response, but it might not be that accurate. An example of speculative design is um, if you look at the Near Future Laboratory, there's lots of cool stuff that come out of the Near Future Laboratory. And this is um, what they've done is they've made a quick start guide for an autonomous vehicle. And a quick start guide, everyone's familiar with it. So it's something which you're super familiar with, but it's assuming that the autonomous vehicle exists. And one of the things that they're talking about is if you've parked your car, but you put it in EverDrive, and EverDrive means that the car's just gonna go off and pick up Ubers for you, and just drive Uber for you all night, it's gonna give you some income. What happens if there's an incident that the CCTV doesn't capture? And immediately that draws up all of these like, oh, hang on a minute, so what, would I be happy with my car driving Ubers at night? And then what surveillance would I need in order to make sure that if anything went wrong, I wouldn't be held responsible? So in something as simple as a quick start guide, it's suddenly evoking all of these like values, emotions and stuff, which puts you in a good position to start talking and having conversations about the autonomous vehicles and, and the future of autonomous vehicles. You can ask people about trust and privacy and after they've read this quick start guide, people are like much more able to talk about it. Whereas if we just sat down and said, oh, what do you think about trust in autonomous vehicles? You'd be like, oh, uh, I don't know, it's gonna park itself. But, so well worth, um, well worth looking into. Another really quick example, um, speculative design for education. So, so this, um, this is Vais Hamid Khan was looking at he, he was looking at the future of education in Pakistan post-COVID um, where you've got um, 
really, obviously, city schools, you've got really informal schools as well. This isn't government education. This is just literally informal schools run altruistically by people um, where you've got, yeah, from like, from grammar schools right down to these types of things. And he created several speculative designs, say classroom in a box, which is like a one-stop solution that comes with a laptop and solar panels and a microphone and everything. And so you could just almost deploy it and you can have someone in the city talking to these people really remotely. And all, all, of, all of these things are about how do we almost um, democratize education a little bit so it's not getting a better education in the city. A drone projection where a drone comes from the city and it delivers a holographic projection of a teacher giving class and stuff. And so he created a whole bunch of cards with several of these types of things, say like in the classroom on wheels, um, where, which is like almost a rickshaw, someone drives it up, just sets up the classroom components and it can be done anywhere in the country and stuff. So, so some very nice ideas where these were used as almost playing cards and he was running workshops where he would say, okay, uh, in your particular um, village or like wherever you're teaching, how could one of these designs work? You can almost, you know, add cards to your designs. And this is, this is written up in the paper that's on the slides. Um, and that's another example of speculative design. So my particular one is Neighbourhood Watch. So I made an app that explores a couple of things. It explores, there we go. It's an app where the opening page is here. So you see electricity demand near me and it just shows all of the transformers around the place and what percentage they are. So like those red ones are running at 90% and the higher ones up are at 60%. And then you can drop down menu and you can click on the energy consumption of a particular street. So you can say like, oh, I'm not using any power, but they're saying on the news that it's just about to pop. What's going wrong here? Oh, it's Durham Street, naughty Durham Street. So you can click on any house on Durham Street and you can see their individual use with that last one. And this is an app that people can use and it's an app that I prototyped with people in Brisbane. And you can always pick your suburb and stuff. This, this was Adobe XD, the software. Um, and, and it got a lot of people thinking. It was communicating two things. It was firstly communicating that energy demand is a very geographic thing, that you can have transformers that are perfectly fine in one area, but transformers that are at absolute peak in a different area, depending on individual consumption in the region. So it's not, it's like, it's easy on the news to say, oh, everyone turn it off. But in actual fact, it's probably more like, all right, you guys need to turn off your air conditioners there you need to switch off your coal rooms or something. It's much more geographic. And the other thing is the attribution. So it's almost a bit like water restrictions. If you see middle of a drought, neighbors watering their lawn, it's like you bastards. <laughs> you can't do the same with electricity because it's, it's, it's something which is invisible. But what if you could actually see the load signatures and say, oh, that person's got the, um, the oven on. Surely they can be cooking an hour, an hour earlier when there's still solar available. So yeah. The two things I wanted to ask people about was attribution of energy use, and so therefore questions over curtailment, would you turn off? What evidence would you want to see that your neighbours were turning off? And also, um, kind of, um, it's, I guess it's a bit through of trust, but also just the geographic distribution of, of energy. So once people use this app, and with Adobe XD you can prototype it, so it, it, it literally comes as um, as an app, like it's a, it's a Chrome extension, but it behaves like an app, so you can click through it. So people would click through it and they'd ask me questions as they went, and then I asked them questions about these scenarios to discuss desirable energy futures. And this really rapidly increased people's energy literacy to a point where you could have quite informed conversations about these types of things around voluntary curtailment and like around attribution, which you just couldn't have if you just you know, rocked up to someone's house and started asking them, you know, fairly complicated questions around energy use. This is, this is kind of um, 
the whole privacy thing was a real, um, the findings which are in the paper, like if you use Google Neighbourhood Watch with watch having two T's, so therefore make sure it's in quotation marks, Neighbourhood Watch, um, we wrote a paper on it um, and, and came up with some interesting findings um, about charting awareness and values towards privacy and consent and exploring barriers to motivation uh, in energy network concerns, such as voluntary detailment. And without going in, into the results too much, some really interesting themes came up around energy use that it's like, hang on a minute, if it's that easy to track your energy data, um, doesn't that mean that um, people are watching you? So like um, people's values, people were talking about corporate surveillance, people were actually really happy to be surveilled. It's just like, oh look, Siri is listening to all your conversations, Alexa's recording what you say. Um, so yeah, look, energy data is just pretty much the same. Um, someone said, well, what does that mean about the kids? Because if they're surveilling me through the energy data, they're probably surveilling my kids as well. Because you can, you know, through load signatures, you can you can pick up things like say heaters and um, and and like what if you know I could bust my twelve year old for being up past midnight and stuff. Talking, um, yeah, interfamily concerns and surveillance. Yeah, if they're monitoring me, they're monitoring the kids too, right? Uh, should my kids know? So consent started to come out as, as like, hang on a minute, how do we consent to this? Something like Google Maps, you don't sign a consent form saying I agree for the front of my house to be photographed and for the top of my house to be photographed and for you over time to be able to see the different things in my front yard such as how I'm maintaining my trees and stuff. There's no consent there, but it just happens and everyone's just like, oh yeah, fair enough. Whereas other things like say healthcare data, very managed, you have to sign forms. I agree to share my data with you. So we were having these conversations about where energy sits in terms of um, the future of almost corporate surveillance and energy use data. Where should consent happen? We were getting some really good conversations here about what the future of energy should look like. And it was all thanks to speculative design, basically, enabling you to, or enabling the participants to suspend their disbelief about change and go, wow, what if this actually existed? So you're talking about something which exists. So I can really recommend it. What we're going to do, um, we're going to work in groups. We've got about 20 minutes, I think. Um, we're going to work in groups to design an alternative speculative energy future to engage participants in conversation about desirable futures. I'd like you to build an app because I think it's easier. Speculative design isn't just about building apps, but, but just for the purpose of this workshop, I think having an app is really just an easy thing to do. We've got the groups online, um, and we've also got the Padlet boards, which are in the um, chat. Yeah, so, so the original groups were groups of four, was it groups of three, groups of four? Mm -hmm. And in this mission, you're building, an, you're building an app and the app is going to have some projection about the future of energy. So it might be an app where electricity is now $5.50 a kilowatt hour. So right, I mean, at the minute it's 25 cents a kilowatt hour. What if electricity was $5.50? Everyone's whinging about electricity use, but really, you know, we've we got lots of stuff on. I've, I've, I've got all my sound system turned on at home. It, it's chewing up power. If, it was, if, if electricity was $5.50, you'd really have to manage it more. Another option might be even a bit like Neighbourhood Watch, um, where what if you have to build an app in a future where electricity is completely privatised so electricity companies can do anything they want and there's no government regulation. You might design an app about where there's an electricity future of completely cost reflective pricing. So you might even be paid to use power in the middle of the day, but then it might cost $15 a kilowatt hour um, for just half an hour at peak time. So it's up to you to discuss in your groups kind of which one but you just have to create an app to assist people with one of those possible energy futures that gets people in the mindset of that future. Now, does that make sense? Any questions and any questions online? Just 
unmute yourself and jump in rather than chat. We didn't have a lot of time, of course, but hopefully we've, we've had enough time. I'd love someone online to share their idea for an app depicting a speculative future of energy. Who'd like to go? Feel free to unmute yourself and jump on in. Don't think there was anything on the padlet. No, there are a couple of bits. Yeah. Yeah, hi Steve, it's Kevin. Good. Okay. How are you going? Good, good. Um, all right, I put something up there quickly. Um, so uh, do I have to disclose that I was part of writing that paper with you before? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so I put something down there under group one and while it was a brief exercise, I think, um, and this is something I've thought about before. I hadn't thought about it in, in at this level of practicality. So that was really useful to spend just those few minutes. And, and so on. So group one, I've got there. So what if the use of household electrical appliances was automated? <clears throat> and so this is in a context where um, it's expected that to some extent it, uh, the use of electricity by households will be automated in the future. It's not seen as feasible to provide reliable and affordable electricity otherwise by the energy sector at the moment. And so I decided to set the, con the context here as everyone's got rooftop solar and all cars are electric, um, which implies that people would charge them at home mostly. Both of those things um, would cause the most disruption to the electricity system, which in this case means essentially there'd be quite a lot of uh, unplanned outages or otherwise known as blackouts. Um, if those um, uses of the electricity system weren't automated or it would cost billions of dollars to um, make the system um, able to cope with that, which means electricity prices would go through the roof again. So I only got as far in my thinking there as saying, it's just thinking about well, what would an app do in that case? How could an app assist with that? Assuming that, well, we know that people won't be happy with things being fully automated, but using an app and, uh, you know, whether it's Wizard of Oz or the other approaches, being used under different terms, then it could be could usefully find out, well, what exactly is it that people would object to? So I think that would be a really useful exercise in, in my research context. And in this case, I start to think, well, what, what might people need to know if, you know, it, just using an app to help them understand, well, yes, they might want to opt out from, um, letting their car be charging be automated, maybe be because they need it fully charged by nine o'clock in the evening for some, for some reason. And so the app would maybe display, well, how available is electricity at the moment? You know, how stressed is the network, similar to Steve's um, mocked up app that he showed. Um, and that might, that might mean if it's like fully stressed out, then they might not be able to do it, even though they, they need to opt out um, and, and charge their car, but in most cases they would be able to, but that would be, um, an operation that they could tick and say, okay, I want to opt out from this. And the app could tell them, well, given you've got this kind of charger that uses so many kilowatts per hour for each hour of charging, it was going to cost you this much to opt out. Would you like to go ahead with it? Uh, I was, I was thinking of, um, I was thinking of like a doodle poll where you say that I'm going to have my car plugged in between here and here and I need this many kilowatts. So you say a full charge by 9 p.m., like you said. So then the machine can just choose based on the spot price, charge, stop charging, charge, stop charging, charge for a while, stop charging. Um, and it does all that for you. And, and yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a really cool way of, um, of thinking about it. Just in the interest of time, anyone else Online, I'm just going to focus online for now because it's hard to get that cohesion that we've got in here. 
Does anyone else on the line want to talk really briefly about their app or proposal? I think Kevin might have led the charge of that one. I don't know if there were too many more things to put through. No worries. Well, I'm happy to um, to keep going and to jump on to Kate. Yeah.